So last last week we we left off <coughs> we left off at the Opium War, and um, we saw that uh, the English, in the name of free trade, they um, forced the Chinese to um, uh, concede uh, five ports uh, where uh, they and other Westerners could come and trade, and they imposed the big indemnity saying that China was responsible for the war. And this is uh, generally regarded as the beginning of the, what is called the century of hum humiliation, actually it lasted longer, and uh, it is central in terms of understanding uh, the formation of uh, Chinese mainland people of their own history, that is to say, humiliation by the West. And 1949, uh, the triumph of the Chinese Revolution represents their liberation from this liberation, from this um, humiliation. Um, and I was going to go on and talk about a little bit about the history of this, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to turn to the review questions on China and uh, your business in terms of, um, you know, uh, doing the exams and so on and finishing this. So, um, uh, I'm now reviewing the questions on China on the review, the review questions. And, of course, um, I'm recording these, so like all the others, you have them uh, on YouTube. So um, the first question deals with the Chinese bureaucracy. Remember, we spoke about uh, the mandarins and so on and Confucianism. So the question is, in comparison to the bureaucracies of the Russian, Ottoman, Mughal, and most European states, the Chinese bureaucracy was highly effective. Um, and uh, in terms of answering this question, I think, um, I think you, uh, if you look at all these others, uh, uh, these other um, entities, other states, in fact, um, it's clear that the Chinese state was a better administrated state than all of the ones that I've mentioned. However, it had its limits, and I'll describe them. And so I think you know, one should take a positive view, but uh, clearly there are some reservations. Um, in, the first, uh, in the first place, uh, one should note uh, that the Chinese state, uh, or a political state in China, has, um, has since the year 1800 BC, there's been a continuous history of political states in China, which would mean some bureaucracy. And then um, we noted that uh, during the period 200 BC until 200 AD, China was fully unified uh, under the Qin and especially the Han Dynasty. Uh, this period coincident with the Roman Empire China became a unified state, and it has, uh, there have been ups and downs, but China has remained a unified state ever since. Um, that um, the, the, uh, one of the uh, striking features of the Chinese uh, state apparatus is, whereas uh, in all of the other um, uh, civilizations that we've covered, uh, it's either the religious and the military elite. Uh, they come from the landlords, but it's either a military or a landlord, a religious elite, which dominates the state. But in, um, in China, uh, these elites did exist, but uh, they were subordinate and did not play a central role. 
Rather, it was the secular intellectual class, the mandarins, who were, edu who were educated in a secular way, separate from religion, and they, uh, they didn't involve themselves directly in the military, who were the administrators. At the same time, um, as I said, they, like uh, all the other elites that we've covered, they did come from the landlord class, and so the state uh, represented the uh, fundamentally the interests of the landlord class. I mean, uh, they were supposed to represent everybody, but the, the reality is they came from the landlord class and they reflected uh, their attitudes. And um, when it comes to um, um, their ideology, it was Confucianism. This uh, secular, moral, mainly moral, and to some extent a metaphys metaphysical system. Uh, there was no preoccupation with metaphysics. Uh, it was all about what is the good life, what is the good society, uh, these, um, what, is, uh, what is morality. These are the kinds of questions that uh, Confucianism was all about. And um, the idea was that um, the people should not be governed uh, directly by force, but rather by the good example of the Mandarin class. That is to say, the Mandarin class lived a moral life and governed in a moral way, the people would accept their rule. The people would accept their rule. That they, uh, they governed by their good example. Of course, this is the ideal. The reality was, of course, uh, quite different. But I'm just giving you this sort of uh, this this uh, ideological uh, rationalization for. Uh, but in, um, and topping this off was the fact that by the 10th century, entry into the Mandarin class was by examination, state examination. State schools were set up and. If you would have wanted to become a Mandarin, you have to be you had to be uh, really smart. And uh, all over China, there were these schools, uh, state schools, which taught Confucianism and prepared students for the state examination. So um, the conclusion is uh, uh, to this is that. State, uh, the China, as a result of this system, when you compare it to the um, other civilization, including the West, it wasn't until the 18th century that the West developed, the states of the West began to develop bureaucracies which are comparable to this setup. Um, on the other hand, and uh, we should say that uh, Confucianism was not the same thing uh, as the uh, sort of uh, scientific philosophy of Galileo and Newton, which is not a scientific philosophy. And uh, of course, I'm pointing to the fact that uh, by the 17th century, the West, uh, the scientific revolution was in, was in course and uh, a kind of scientific, epistemologically empirical uh, approach to reality began to do uh, uh, empirical and rational approach. The scientific method, which I'm sure you encountered, emerged in the West in the 17th century. And uh, uh, Confucianism tended to be sort of an idealism. Uh, it was not materially grounded. It was not um, it was not focused on empirical realities in the same way as the scientific method. Um, and um, indeed, uh, by the 17th century, whereas China had been in the lead in terms of scientific and technical innovation, uh, there was no comparison. Uh, the, the Chinese were way more advanced than the West, and most of the new inventions were coming from China, um, uh, especially under the Ming, and I explained 
in the Ming period, this extreme orthodoxy. Um, and really, it, they turned their back. There were um, uh, sort of Western um, scientists. I'm really talking about the Jesuits. Uh, the Jesuits began to, uh, they came to the, the Chinese, uh, to Beijing in the late 16th century, and they brought with them uh, a, a more scientific approach. But um, in the early 17th century, along with the purging of some of these extreme Confucian sects, uh, there was a crackdown on the Jesuits, and they were expelled. And really, there was a kind of decline of interest in this sort of Western scientific methodology. So it's this extreme, extremely conservative Confucianism which dominates uh, in China. And uh, of course, uh, in back of that is uh, the Chinese idea that uh, China is uh, the best. Uh, ethnocentrism, the West has nothing to offer us. Um, and um, we basically, we know everything. Uh, I'm talking about the elites here. Um, and um, this is, of course, rooted in, it's rooted in this ideology, but it's rooted also in the kind of um, the dominance of uh, sort of landlordism in China. The landlords is against the merchants. They keep pushing the merchants down uh, and trying to sort of keep out foreign influences and so on. Um, uh, and so uh, if this is the attitude of the Mandarin class, there is a kind of conservatism, is a turning inward. There's a lack of adaptability dealing with the West, but also dealing with China's internal problems. And of course, I mentioned that. The basic problem is the problem of feeding the population and for the pe people to have land. And they're not interested in this, resolving it, the uh, intellectual elite. They're not interested because they are self-interested. They come from the landlord class and they're not interested in solving these problems. Okay, that's the answer to that one. Um, and uh, here, uh, this, this next question looks at thing, uh, this uh, previous answer sort of develops another aspect of it. And it says, why did the Chinese elite distrust merchant activity? Explain and illustrate. Why did the Chinese elite distrust uh, merchant activity? Well, let's begin with the Confucian, um, uh, Confucius uh, and the Confucians' attitude toward the social hierarchy. What is the proper hierarchy in society? Well, at the top, of course, uh, come the, uh, uh, the mandarins, the emperor, the mandarins, and then below them are the landlords. This is the proper ordering. And then for them, uh, uh, below them come the peasants, the peasants, then the craftsmen, and at the bottom are the merchants. Uh, in a good society, according to the these Confucians, these Mandarins, the merchants will be at the bottom of society. And why is that? Because they're the least moral. Uh, Confucianism is all about morality, and merchants are um, immoral or amoral. Uh, they're out for the buck. And uh, craftiness, cleverness, manipulating people, take advantage of people, that's what it's all about. And so these people are morally inferior and they need to be controlled. Now, there's something, <laughs> there's something to this, but the main thing is that this is coming from the landlords. This is coming from the landlord elite. Uh, they see the merchants as their rivals. They threaten the power of this whole apparatus. And so that's why they keep the in terms of this ideology, they, they elaborate this anti-merchant uh, attitude. Uh, that's the fundamental reason. And then, of course, there is the ethnocentrism. 
um, foreigners are bringing all sorts of ideas, maybe some ideas about science and technology. No, uh, these are, uh, we have everything in China. We know everything in China. It's just ethnocentrism. And remember, I, I said that all of the societies we've covered were ethnocentric, but in China, because China had achieved such uh, power in Asia, it was dominant, all the other states had emerged basically from Chinese culture. Um, and this is typical of uh, uh, great states, great empires. I mean, in their day, uh, of course, uh, the, the English, the British, who are so humbled now, you see the state that England is in today. Um, and in the 19th century, when they're in their heyday, uh, everybody else was a walk. Everybody else was inferior. We're top dog. Likewise, uh, if you look uh, at the uh, the American attitude in the recent in their recent history, America, it's the exception. It's the, uh, the the city on the hill. It's God's country. It's whatever. Uh, th this is a common attitude, and uh, in the case of China, it, uh, it, it uh, was uh, especially difficult. Uh, all of these countries that I've named just now are having difficulty, the Americans are having difficulty, uh, uh, from the fact that uh, their superiority is in question, and so they're having a nervous breakdown. Uh, but. Um, um, the Chinese, because they had been in Asia so dominant, it was very difficult for them to adapt to the new reality. So ethnocentrism and anti-merchant attitude. And um, um, so I guess I would say that uh, um, basically um, they viewed merchants as destabilizing uh, this um, this order, this Confucian order, which was based on um, respect for the government, respect for uh, the upper class, the educated upper class, respect for the elders in the community, um, that um, uh, uh, this was the reason why they were anti-merchant. So that takes care of that question. Then the next question is, um, explain the collapse of the Ming Dynasty and its replacement by the Qing. And so you want to tell me that the Ming uh, uh, Dynasty took power in 1368 and that it was overthrown in 1644. Those are the dates. And then uh, you uh, then proceed by, by saying that um, the Ming took power in 1368 on a program of the restoration of the Han to power. The Mongols had invaded and they had become the ruling class. They were kicked out. The Han came back and uh, this restoration uh, was based on, um, first of all, um, the uh, strict adherence to Confucian ideology. Um, by the way, the, the Wan period was a period of great confusion and uh, I would say moral decadence and corruption. Uh, this whole period of the rule of the Mongols was, uh, was basically a disaster. Um, and so uh, this was a restoration, restoration of the Han, restoration of of Confucianism, but also uh, it was uh, a, and I think that in terms of Chinese history, it was uh, extraordinary because the uh, first emperor introduced a serious land reform. Land was taken in large amounts from the uh, landlords and given to the peasantry, what we call agrarian reform. Uh, when you hear the term agrarian reform, this is what it means. 50% um, of the land went to the peasants. 
the landlords retained, and this was a mistake in my opinion, 50% uh, of the land and uh, they came back. It's one of, uh, one of the problems. Um, but uh, so there was this agrarian reform, but also reform of the Mandarin bureaucracy because uh, the, uh, under the early Ming, 50% of the Mandarins came from the peasants. There was social mobility upwards. Uh, bright peasant boys, we're not talking about girls because girls, this was an extremely um, uh, unequal society when it came to women. Um, but uh, uh, um, smart boys could uh, move into the man, uh, into the Mandarin class. Uh, so, um, and finally, this, this whole idea of good government, the army has to grow its own food. Um, government is devolved from the center to the uh, local uh, level so as to reduce the burden on the ordinary people, reduce the burden of taxation on the uh, ordinary people. And corruption is, um, is uh, rooted out uh, uh, and severely punished. Um, and uh, and uh, finally, uh, there is this, uh, in terms of Confucianism, as I explained, uh, uh, Confucianism is our guidepost. There can be no deviation. Orthodoxy reigns. We're not interested in intellectual. We're interested in maintaining, uh, at all costs, orthodoxy when it comes to Confucian uh, teaching. So I would say that uh, well and good, uh, and the Ming, under the Ming, China grew. Uh, there was significant uh, economic and commercial development under, um, under the Ming, and all sorts of new manufacturing and commercial activity and even contact with the West, although reluctantly, or the West, foreigners, the West, uh, uh, came into China during the Ming period. Um, although the state remained extremely suspicious. Um, but um, I would say that um, in terms of the problem, the problems uh, became apparent toward the end of the 16th, the beginning of the 17th century. China fell into an economic depression, and the main manifestation of that was um, that there was a shortage of silver, um, and of course I explained that in terms of um, the, uh, the end of the silver boom in the New World. Remember I said that the Spaniards and the Ottomans, they, they, they fell into similar difficulties. The Chinese, there was a scarcity of uh, silver. But below that, uh, the underlying problems were uh, uh, much deeper. Um, and uh, basically you had uh, the fact that they had not resolved the agrarian problem. It had come back uh, by, the vir by virtue of the action of the market. The market, uh, uh, whatever uh, some economists uh, uh, may say in the economics department here, the market is inherently uh, polarizing. There are winners and losers in the market. And over time, we're talking about 300 years, uh, the peasants, uh, they, uh, crops failed, they got into debt, they had to, they had to uh, hand over their land to the landlords, and by the late 16th and uh, uh, early 17th century, uh, there was this uh, redevelopment of social polarization. There were a lot of landless peasants, and uh, this was of course, uh, the grounds for the growing peasant unrest that began to become evident in the early decades of the 17th century. Um, and uh, I guess uh, in terms of explaining this uh, collapse of the Ming, uh, you want to mention, I've already mentioned it, so I'm not going to go back, 
the fact that the intellectuals, the bureaucracy, the state uh, didn't respond to these problems um, because of the Confucian orthodoxy that I spoke about. They were rigid uh, and uh, uh, they did not develop any kind of an answer. And finally, I would note, of course, the rise of the Manchu state in uh, what is now Manchuria, the Manchus, Nurhachi, I, uh, I spoke about that in the previous lecture. Uh, uh, all of these internal problems weaken China, and therefore the, uh, the, uh, the Manchus, who were warriors, uh, could invade and with success. So that's the answer to that one. And then uh, finally we have the last uh, question. Um, the Qing dynasty, the, uh, or the Qing dynasty, entered a crisis at the end of the 18th century. Uh, explain the source of the difficulties. Uh, we've considered the decline of the Ming, and now we're considering the decline of the Qing. Why did they get into trouble? So in answering that question, um, you want to begin by, say, by looking at the bright side, and so you say, well, by 1681, the king had stabilized their rule over China. They opened up to foreign trade by 1685. And internally, China experienced um, um, more than a century of prosperity, certain prosperity uh, developed in China. And uh, it was based on peace and stability. Uh, it was based on um, China welcomed foreign trade, but internally there was a, a further development of the whole uh, commercial infrastructure of China in the uh, 18th century. Um, and we see the traditional products like cotton and silk and porcelain, they all come back and are, are stronger than ever. We see the tea industry becomes an international in industry. Remember I stressed the growth of the international market for tea, particularly in Europe and in England. Um, all of that happens. Um, and uh, we, we have in terms of nutrition, it's not merely rice and wheat and peanuts and potatoes. It's now corn. In the 18th century, corn become, which is of course, um, fattening, uh, people can, um, and animals can eat corn, and that's important, um, because the population is growing. Um, so well, all of that is to the good, but um, the problem is that, uh, first of all, the problem of over-exploitation by the landlords and the state, they never, the, the king never addressed the question the agrarian question. And by, uh, really, by, even at the time that they did, they took power, uh, there was a serious problem. The population had reached uh, uh, around uh, 265 million people. And under the king, uh, by the beginning of the 19th century, it was 360 million people. And a lot more and more of these uh, peasants were poor and landless. They didn't even have any land. Uh, if they farmed at all, they, uh, they either worked for the, uh, the wealthy peasants or they had to rent land because they, uh, they could not own it. And so the agrarian question was worse than ever. That, that's the fundamental thing. Um, but um, uh, also now um, you have um, the fact that the state... Uh, uh, is having difficulty meeting its budgets because uh, they have this, these big military campaigns taking over Mongolia, uh, taking over Tibet, um, and a certain state debt has uh, developed. There is growing corruption at the end of the 18th century, and above all, it is the, the spread of uh, opium addiction spread by the British, uh, which uh, really uh, 
becomes an extremely serious problem in the opening decades, uh, leading eventually to a, uh, amongst other things, violence and so on, but also, of course, the balance of trade and the balance of payments, which historically, from time immemorial, had been in, in China's favor, is lost, and China is basically exporting more silver than it is uh, uh, bringing in. And so uh, the, uh, the, uh, all of these problems, and then, of course, the outbreak of the Opium War uh, uh, signals um, a crisis. Uh, just maybe I should say one thing. One of the, uh, uh, I'm turning away from this now, but I should say that uh, one of the symptoms and one of the most interesting features of this crisis is that uh, yeah, things were re uh, after the opium, the first opium war. There were two. The first opium war uh, ended in 1842, and then uh, in southern China. Um, because of the problem, all the problems I've mentioned, and the cause of the foreigners uh, and what they were doing, a huge peasant revolt developed in China. It's called the Taiping Rebellion. I'm just telling you the story because it's so interesting. And um, this was vast. This was enormous. Uh, uh, historians say that this was the biggest event of the 19th century because uh, uh, I'm talking about global history now, because in the course of this uh, upheaval, the leader, by the way, was a peasant uh, who claimed um, he had come under, he had failed the, uh, the examination to enter the Mandarin, Mandarinate, and he uh, came under the influence of Christian missionaries, and at a certain point he announced that he was the uh, the brother of Jesus Christ. And uh, the the, uh, the revolt that emerged, uh, the ideology was a kind of variant version of Christianity, a variant version, obviously unorthodox, completely unorthodox. Um, it's not uncommon. Uh, you see this happening in many places, including Africa and so on, uh, in the 19th century. Um, in any case, uh, uh, this revolt uh, shook the foundations of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the king rule, and the British and the French, ultimately, um, they became so alarmed that the peasants would take over that uh, they allied themselves with the emperor and helped the king government to survive. Uh, they were able to suppress this rebellion. 20 million peasants died in this uh, rebellion. 20 million peasants died in this rebellion. So this was a big event, the Taiping Rebellion. And it, in terms of the study of Chinese history, it's very important. Uh, so uh, I'll leave it at that, and um, we'll, we'll um, we're moving to the west now. We're we're changing gears, uh, and we're going to look now. Oh, by the way, sorry, I didn't just do this. We're we're looking at the west. So let's, uh, let's start with England, and you will remember that in England, capitalism rose by the 17th century, the middle class, getting stronger and stronger. There was a collision between the parliament and the, and the Stuart kings. Uh, there was a revolution in the middle of the 17th century. Uh, uh, the Stuarts were overthrown. They tried to set up a republic. Ultimately, there was so much unrest within England they had to bring back the Stuarts um, and Charles II and then his brother, James. James took power in 1685. Now, Charles, the first uh, uh, king of the restoration, what's called the restoration, he uh, 
he was uh, politically, he was quite smart, and he got along with, he tried to get along with Parliament. And uh, clearly, Parliament had the initiative. He could not get anything, he could not raise revenues without consent of the Parliament, which was the basic issue. But his brother was not so smart. Uh, he was very stubborn, and he had secretly converted to the Catholic faith, and he looked at uh, France, uh, Louis XIV is in power, absolutism. So his, uh, James II's idea is, I'm going to bring back absolutism and Catholicism. And within three years, uh, the parliament organized a conspiracy. They brought in the executive from Holland and uh, James II was overthrown in what is called the Glorious Revolution. And the Stuarts uh, lost the throne and the House of Orange, the Dutch uh, dynasty, took power. And the main thing was, it was now clear, England was a constitutional monarchy. The parliament was the ultimately sovereign entity uh, within the state. Um, and uh, this, of course, signified that the capitalist class had basically now was the ruling class in England. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but um, to simplify, the middle class through the parliament uh, basically uh, made the law and controlled the money. And on, on the basis of this constitutional government in 1688, and given the growing economic power of the middle class and capitalism, England expre uh, experienced uh, extraordinary uh, economic growth in the 18th century. Commercial revolution, agricultural revolution, Unpre unprecedented economic growth in the 18th century. Uh, and um, so agriculture, manufacturing, it all forges ahead. And new institutions are created, or in a whole framework um, for managing a capitalist economy. The Bank of England is founded in the wake of this revolution. Um, the national debt uh, is founded. Well, you might think that debt is a bad thing. Uh, well, if it's too much. Of course, it's a bad thing. But debt, uh, capitalism works on advances. Uh, the capitalist class doesn't uh, invest its, it uses its capital to borrow more money so that it, I mean, people who are really in business, if any of you are in business or lucky enough to be in business, you borrow the money that you invest. Um, and then, of course, you have some collateral back of you. A lot of them don't. Look at what happened to these uh, cryptocurrencies. It's happening. It's, it's collapsing. But uh, the way, that's the way it operates. Well, the national debt sort of regulates the rate of interest. You have to, you have, to have a national debt. Uh, uh, what it, the... Uh, it enables the government to control the rate of interest, which is central to the way a capitalist economy runs. So the English create this, a national debt. Bank of England, national debt. The English pound, a stable currency backed by the Bank of England. Um, a sophisticated stock exchange. Um, joint stock companies of every description. People can invest their money in essentially joint stock companies in the 18th century, investing in everything, including the Hudson's Bay Company and so on. Like, uh, it's all happening uh, by the 18th century in England. And uh, in comparison to Holland, Holland is basically reduced to being permanently the junior partner of England. Um, they don't have uh, the cheap food. They don't have the cheap fuel, coal, in the case of England, they don't have the cheap food, they don't have the cheap coal, uh, they don't have a large enough population to create a real big market, and also uh, to um, uh, 
to, uh, from which a strong army can be recruited. So England has all the advantages. And so England is, is ahead in terms of capital. And this is shown by the wars with Fred at France at this time. Remember, we reviewed the wars with France, the wars of Louis XIV. The English emerge, a capitalist economy, a constitutional government, rather than absolutism and feudalism. Capitalism is against feudalism. Constitutionalism is against absolutism. England emerges at the end of these wars uh, demonstrably superior to uh, the setup in France. So we still have um, some time. Um, and so um, the um, what I would say about all this is that by at the end of this, by the beginning, by the opening decades of the 18th century, England is uh, uh, militarily, uh, uh, its navy certainly, but uh, even its army uh, is so powerful that uh, basically they are the dominant power in Europe and globally now. Um, the other empires, the other states, the Ottoman Empire, India, and now we see China. Uh, these societies cannot, uh, given this uh, powerful engine, capitalist engine that has developed, um, there's no way that any of these empires can resist the force, uh, the military force, the political force, the economic power of England. Um, now, um, I want to uh, say, yes, it's capitalism, but uh, still mercantilism. The state continues in the 18th century. England is achieving its success not by the free market. The state is backing capitalism at every turn. Uh, the whole development of the colonial empire is, and the armies and navies that are fielded, it's all the state. The state is regulating exports and imports. They won't allow any foreign goods rivaling English industry to come into the country. Uh, they're protecting their industries. This is still mercantilism. Um, and the state is very important in terms of, of course, keeping law and order, uh, keeping the lower classes in, uh, in line, protecting private property, the law of contracts, and so on. The state. This idea that somehow the state is unnecessary, this is ridiculous. Uh, this is the ideology that is being pervaded in Canada right now. It's complete stupidity. Uh, in any case, now we come to the number. In the 18th century, there are two great English thinkers who basically develop an ideology around the development of capital. These are the founders of what we call liberalism. We're now talking about the liberal ideology. What is it all about? And the first of these is John Locke, John Locke. And the second is Adam Smith, these two thinkers. So I, I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, both of them because you need to know these things. You need to know this. Um, now, um, John Locke, um, he was a, a very important intellectual uh, amongst the opposition to James II. Uh, James' an attempt to reestablish a kind of absolute rule in England. He was uh, the leading intellectual, John Locke. Mm -hmm. And um, he, um, he basically... Uh, created the sort of the political justification for constitutional government in England. And um, he, he based his ideas on the fact that one of his contemporaries and indeed acquaintance was Isaac Newton. Uh, uh, and the creation of the kind of uh, the, the scientific revolution is, is crystallizing 
Newton publishes in 1688. Uh, that's the same year as the Glorious Revolution. So um, there is this coincidence. And he, Locke thinks he's working with scientific principles. And so the first thing he says, and I'm coming to an end here because we uh, will have to develop this further next time, is that uh, all of what we know, all of our knowledge comes from experience, from empirical reality. We acquire our knowledge from the senses. So Locke is an empiricist. empiricist. This is what's called empiricism. He's basically the founder with Francis Bacon of empiricism. Uh, all our knowledge comes from uh, cumulative experience. And that means that uh, custom, tradition, innate ideas, the idea, or religious revelation. No, 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 no. Everything comes from experience. And um, um, that is the only certain source of, of, of our knowledge. Um, uh, that's the first principle of John Locke, and I'll stop at this point and we'll carry on.